HP has an initiative called SENSE, or the Central Nervous System for the Earth. And this is a 10-year vis vision to embed a trillion pushpin-sized sensors around the planet to sense kind of the world and, and what's going on. If some of these things come to pass, that 50 billion number could be quite small, dwarfed by the trillions of sensors that we may see in the coming years. And just to illustrate a few examples, devices that we did not historically expect to get connected to the network are getting connected at rapid rates. For example, there's a tree in Brussels that has, uh, is laden with sensors and cameras and is connected to Facebook and tweets. It has 4,000 Twitter followers. How many people in this virtual room can say they have 4,000 Twitter followers, and yet there's a tree that has more than most of us? There's a company, a Dutch company called Sparked, that is connecting sensors to livestock to cows. Each cow is generating 200 megabytes of information per cow per year. Uh, we're seeing a lot of clothing and shoes, and, and there's clothing you can buy for babies now that monitor their health. Um, asthma inhalers, a lot of uh, internet of things in the medical field. Asthma inhalers that have uh, GPS um, uh, sensors and receivers in them, and then they can cross-reference their location with environmental data and advise the, uh, the user what to, to use the inhaler. And then companies like Proteus are embedding RFID chips on top of pills. So on the bottom right there, you'll see a pill. It's about the size of an aspirin. And on top of it is an RFID um, uh, chip, submillimeter uh, RFID, and it's um, designed to be adjusted, and this pill will uh, transmit um, its information to a, a plaster or a band-aid uh, on, your, on your body, which will in turn uh, broadcast through your wireless device, your mobile phone, to your physician, letting them know that you've taken your pill, uh, that type of thing. So we're seeing all sorts of devices that historically were not connected to the network getting connected, and these are, this is just the sampling. As we move from IPv4 to IPv6, we know that IPv4 has an addressing space of about 4 billion addresses. Well, with IPv6, there are enough addresses available that everyone on this call could have 52,000 trillion trillion addresses each. Every star in the known universe could have almost 5 trillion addresses each, and then every atom on this planet could have 100 addresses per atom. Point to this is simply that as we transition to IPv6 over the coming years, there are enough addresses available in this space to literally give every speck of dust, every grain of sand on this planet a IP address. So why is all of this relevant or important? Well, historically throughout our history, we've had our five senses to sense what's going on in our world, vision, hearing, touch, and so on. We're extending that ability significantly through the sensors that we're putting around our world. That creates vast amounts of data that we can then mine to turn into information and knowledge and wisdom. This ultimately means that human beings are becoming wiser, we're becoming more knowledgeable about ourselves, about one another, about the world in which we live and the environment, because we can now sense it ever uh, increasing rates. So from a networking perspective, what does that mean? Well, it means that we're seeing billions of devices getting connected. The types of networks are changing. We're seeing networks that are much more mobile, networks that um, must consider security uh, more, networks that are dynamic in nature, networks that are 30,000 feet up in the air and on the ground. So different types of networking models, and they demand a next generation network. Now, with all of these devices getting connected, billions and billions of devices, what about the data they're creating? What about all this information and how will we handle it? So that's the notion of the Zeta Flood. So let's talk about all this information. In 2008, we created five exabytes of new information. Now, five exabytes is a lot of new data. That's about a billion DVDs worth of new data. We created in one year more new data than we did in the past 5,000 years. In other words, ever, as far as, as far as we're concerned. But if we jump forward just a few years to, um, let's say, 2011, you know, we're now creating 1.2 zettabytes of unique information, so orders of magnitude more information. This is the equivalent of 125 million years of your favorite one-hour TV show, video show, 
125 million years of that being created on an annualized basis. And this is new information that we're creating. Uh, by 2015, one zettabyte of this information is expected to flow across the network. And roughly 90 plus percent of that information is expected to be rich media or video. And to put that in perspective, you know, because it's hard for people to understand, well, what is a zettabyte tangibly? Well, a zettabyte, if you could build a bookshelf from Earth to Pluto 20 times, that's a 72 billion mile bookshelf, that's how much data will be flowing across the network by 2015. You look at just some of the examples of this data that we're creating, 200 billion email messages sent every single day, more than 50 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every single minute, that's two days worth of video every single minute. Facebook, 40 billion photos, well over 3 billion photos are uploaded to Facebook every single month. That's every other person on the planet uploading a photo to Facebook every month. By 2015, a million video minutes will traverse the network every single second. And then the mobile devices, we're seeing a huge increase in the number of mobile devices that are connecting to the network. You know, by 2015, more mobile devices will connect to the network than fixed devices. And two thirds of the mobile data traffic by 2015 will be video. So these devices, these tablets, these iPhones, these Android devices are huge consumers and creators of video content. And the pace is accelerating. Devices that traditionally were not network connected or displays are becoming displays. So things like your kitchen uh, countertop, your bathroom countertop, the mirror in your bathroom, your glass windows, clothing, um, flexible displays, books, all of these devices are becoming uh, network connected and create and consume rich media, which has significant network implications. So we're seeing all sorts of things that are, are creating and consuming video. We're also seeing video and um, images become much fatter, if you will. Uh, if you take medical scans as an example, you know, a few years ago, your typical medical scan, a CAT scan or MRI scan, might have been uh, 50 megabits or so in size. Today, it's not uncommon to see multi-terabit, and then tomorrow, you know, maybe multi-gigabit. If you look at some of the work that IBM is doing, uh, they have an initiative to map the entire visible universe, and they are generating terapixel images. So we're moving from gigapixel to megapixel, sorry, from megapixel to gigapixel to terapixel images. And these, we'll see more and more terapixel images in the coming years. And these are rich, fat uh, images and video that will be traversing the network. So the Zeta flood will place huge demands on the network. We're seeing orders of magnitude increase in, um, in the demand uh, of the network, which will require different approaches to security uh, and quality of service and efficiency. Sorry, we're just adjusting the heat. We have the uh, heater on for some reason in, in San Jose. Um, so what does this mean? So we're creating all these devices and we are creating massive amounts of data what could we do with this? I want to talk a little bit about the wisdom of the cloud. So people are familiar with the wisdom of the crowd, where we do crowdsourcing. But what about what happens when we put all of this intelligence in the network? What could we do from a meaningful perspective? So we're seeing more and more data move into the cloud. By 2020, within the next year, nine, ten years, about a third of all data will live or pass through the cloud. A third of all data that we create. So keep in mind that that zeta flood of information I talked about, a significant amount of it will live or pass through the cloud. Uh, by some estimates, uh, IT spending on innovation and cloud computing could top a trillion dollars in the next five years. We're seeing a, a shift from moving from the web to virtualization to cloud and more and more content in the cloud. So what does it mean? Well, what it means is that things that have historically been complex for us to do are becoming trivial for us to do now. If you take things like uh, products like WordLens or Google Goggles, the ability to do real-time language translation with a relatively dumb device. You know, we can take a relatively dumb device like a quote-unquote smartphone 
And because it's connected now to this intelligence in the cloud, it allows us to do really powerful things. It allows us to tap into the supercomputing power of the network. So things like language translation, we're starting to take this um, for granted. And yet this is a fairly complex thing to do. And now we can point mobile devices at signs, um, train schedules, and get real-time translation. Uh, technologies like Wolfram Alpha allows anyone to get access to all the world's knowledge in, in a computational way. So things like fluid mechanics, physics, uh, advanced calculus is available to anyone now with a very simple you know, mobile device or tablet device because it's in the cloud. Uh, a number of months ago, um, in the US there's a television show, a game show called Jeopardy, and I believe this is also international. And IBM's supercomputer Watson beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. And the significance here is twofold. One, first of all, this is the first time that a machine beat a human being at a, at a, at a task like this. But more importantly, what IBM was demonstrating was the ability to understand language and parse language at very fast rates. So think about your traditional search engine today. When you go online and you do a search for, for something, you might get 100 million results back. And then you as a human, it's your responsibility to kind of parse through and find the ones that are meaningful. Well, what if you could ask the cloud, the network, the question about any topic, and you only got one result back, and it was the right result every single time. That's the path that we're heading down. That's transformational. So IBM, as an example, um, is moving into healthcare. So we're seeing some of this supercomputing capability move into other fields. So not just entertainment and game shows, but what happens when it moves into legal or healthcare or other uh, sciences, and now it's augmenting the ability to help human beings with uh, targeted relevant information. And what if Watson were a cloud service? What if Watson was in the cloud and you could use a network or a web interface to access it and ask it any question about any topic in the world and get one result back and it's always the right result? What does that mean? And what does it mean for things like education? Does it change how we think about education if the answer is always a click away? Cloud plus crowd is a very powerful combination. We're seeing more and more organizations and governments uh, adopt a very transparent model and start to provide this data to, um, to their citizens. In, in the US, as an example, data.gov is a site where the US government is providing hundreds of thousands of data sets to, uh, to anyone. And people can then build custom applications on that. Um, there are thousands of applications already developed. So as we start to put more and more of this in the cloud, as we, as we open it up, we start to build very powerful combinations. Now, <clears throat> as we think about all of these devices, all of this data, all of this information flowing across the network, one of the questions I often get is, you know, you talk about zettabytes of information, a lot of it video and rich media. What about the network? Will the network be able to sustain this? Will the network collapse under this weight of information? And the short answer is the network is going to, is going to be able to handle this just fine. Let's just talk about a couple of, of advances and, and trends. So as one trend, this is my own network connection to my own home. Um, in 1990, when I started at Cisco, I had a 300 bit per second connection. That allowed me to do one telnet session, uh, very, very slow. And today I have a 50 megabit connection to my home. I have 38 devices in my home today that require an always on network connection. The experiences I now have are much richer, much more immersive. I can do video conferencing, I can do online gaming, I can download any movie on demand. So over the last two decades, my network speed to my home has increased 170,000 times. When I get to a gigabit in the next few years, that's a three million times increase in my network connection to my home. This is not my network connection to a country. This is the network connection to my own house. My own home now has more network bandwidth than most countries had, let's say, a decade or so ago. So, you know, tremendous um, um, advances in network speed to the house. And I should mention that what I pay for my network speed today is one-tenth of what it was a decade ago, and yet 
it's 170,000 times improvement in performance. Imagine if automobiles, for example, followed that same price curve. You could pick up a you know, Lamborghini for you know, 10 cents and we get a million miles to the gallon. So unfortunately, that's not the case. If we look at just some of the advances in the last few months alone, and this is you know, this year, February through May, we're seeing a lot of interesting advances in multi-gigabit, multi-terabit uh, networking speeds, uh, 100 terabits per second over fiber using uh, a single uh, fiber, um, 26 terabits using single laser, even some things as exotic as quantum networking, this notion of doing quantum entanglement over a network. As we start to harness that capability, that may allow for ultra-fast networking speeds uh, anywhere. Uh, if you look at some of the products that are emerging to support the backbone, these are a couple of Cisco products. CRS3, uh, well over 300 terabits per second with this product. That's you and every person in China being on a video call at the exact same time. The Cisco ASR9000, 96 terabits per second. That is you and every single person on this planet being on, on a voice over IP call at the exact same time. And that's with one product. So the network is, is growing to accommodate the tremendous demand that we're placing on it. So the question is, will networks of the future scale to meet future demands? And I think the short answer is absolutely. Networks of tomorrow will be orders of magnitude faster than those of today. So I've given you a bit of a look at some of the trends. Let's talk a little bit about some of the implications of some of these trends. So chapter five is about the world is flat and so is your technology. What we're seeing is significant increases in our ability to communicate. And why is that important? Why do we care? Well, human beings evolve for one reason only. It's not about our technology. It's not about society. It's because we communicate. It, it's because when we discover something, we invent something, we create some advancement, our ability to share that with someone else so they don't literally reinvent the wheel or reinvent a new vaccine or recreate the ability to, to produce a transistor, uh, our ability to communicate is what allows us to build on previous advances and grow. And if you compare the world in which we live today with the world in which we lived just a few hundred years ago, in the 1800s, if I wanted to communicate with anyone else on the planet, I would have done it through a handwritten letter. It would have taken weeks or months to get that information shared with someone. Today, I can communicate with any person on the planet that's connected to the network in milliseconds in rich, immersive ways. And I mean, telepresence is an example, right? I'm talking to half a dozen countries now um, from anywhere in the world in a rich, immersive way and sharing knowledge and information. We, our ability to communicate is growing exponentially. And because it's growing exponentially, we too will, will reap that benefit. We will now start to advance exponentially because we can now share knowledge with each other, beliefs, discoveries, uh, inventions, knowledge. We're going to start to advance at exponential rates. One quick case story I want to talk about, about the world is flat and the implications of the network. Many of you may know Will Goning, who is the uh, marketing manager from the Middle East at Google. And in July um, uh, of 2010, he created this Facebook page. And it created some um, controversy. And he was arrested in, in 2011 and, and held uh, for a couple of weeks, and, and then subsequently released. And this spawned what some are calling the Facebook revolution or the social networking revolution. And we saw this go around the world. But the significance of this story is not just that one individual. It's also about the tools in which he used to communicate and how the world rallied around him. If you look at the things I've highlighted, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, how we communicate, how we share, how we um, talk to one another is changing. These new tools that we're creating for ourselves allow a completely different approach. And we spoke to Whale uh, uh, prior to doing this presentation, and he gave us this quote, and he said, the internet helped the people of Egypt have a voice and create content that gave the world a true picture. The network is changing how the transparency of government is, tra is changing how 
we, people communicate, and it's changing how we as a society think about one another. Uh, earlier in Japan, there was a tragedy in, uh, in Japan. There was an earthquake and uh, a huge tsunami. It was all over the press. I'm sure you've all seen this. But the significance of this story is that people were tweeting about this earthquake before governments and organizations were communicating the fact that this had occurred. And you look at the slide, you have people tweeting to family and friends and warning them in advance that you know this, this earthquake has occurred, this tsunami has occurred, you know, minutes before the US Geological Society had even posted on their site that this event had occurred. So we're starting to see social networking and the usage of social networking and the usage of the internet and the web now get to a point where people are communicating faster than other uh, approaches before. If we follow this trend out and we look at some of the advances in mobile technology, wireless technology, as we move into faster and faster network speeds like LTE and WiMAX, 4G, 5G, as we see the ability for anyone now to become a movie producer, a video editor with a mobile device because of the processing power of those devices and the video editing capability of those devices. And then as we see more and more devices getting connected to the network, like televisions, for example, we're seeing more and more TVs getting connected to the internet. If you start putting these things together, what this means is that within a decade, anyone will be able to broadcast to anyone else in real time on any device. That means that people will tune into people. People will not simply tune into channels and passively watch. People will tune into individuals that are on, on, the, on their feet in the field broadcasting in real time with their mobile device direct to your TV, bypassing intermediaries of online video sharing. So the network, as you've seen, will provide unprecedented transparency, and it's also a huge multiplying effect to catalyze change. Now, as I talk about some of these devices and, and all these things getting connected, the question often arises, well, what about energy? Where will we find the power to power all of these devices? I want to touch on that briefly. We, our dependency on fossil fuels um, is significant. Uh, by some estimates, we need 10 Saudi Arabias to sustain our global demand for fossil fuels. We're seeing a huge trend towards people being urbanized. About half a billion people will be urbanized in the next five year years, in other words, moving into cities. Over the next two decades, we see one city being built every single month that will occupy, uh, will be the equivalent, say, the city of San Francisco in terms of population. So about a million people or so, um, a city that will hold a million people or so will be built every month over the next two decades. Our dependency on energy is growing exponentially. So. What are some of the answers? Well, you know, there's some big things that we could do. Solar, you know, perhaps might be one example. Enough sunlight hits the planet every single hour to power all of our energy needs for a year. Um, it's a it's a very achievable goal. Um, if we built solar farms at the same rate that we deforest this planet, we could complete this project in three years and create enough solar arrays to power all of our needs indefinitely. Um, we're seeing some interesting advances in solar production. Here is a printer that prints solar cells with significantly more efficiency than traditional means. We're seeing some creative approaches to turning glass windows into um, solar cells. And if you look at your typical building, your skyscraper, let's say, there's millions of square feet of glass on a, on a skyscraper, could we turn that into a solar array and power that building? Uh, wind, perhaps, could be another um, possible solution. We know that strategically placed, there's enough wind on the planet to power all of our needs indefinitely. Uh, we produce well over a billion cars today, so building 12 million uh, 5 megawatt wind turbines seems like a, an achievable goal. But let's be honest, the the this is not a technological challenge as much as it's a societal and political challenge. We know that about 0.4% of the Earth's land could be used to power all of our needs through wind and solar. Uh, but this is not going to be about one big massive thing. This is not about let's do an uber solution because this is akin to putting man on the moon. This is a massive undertaking. 
So what's the answer then? The answer is it's going to be a lot of small things working together. And I've just picked a few examples to illustrate. So here's an example of, some, of harvesting energy. Um, MIT developed an artificial leaf, which is more efficient than nature at photosynthesis. And one of these artificial leaves could generate enough power to power a home in the developing world for a day. We're seeing creative approaches to displays. Here's a display from Samsung. No batteries required, no power required. It uses the ambient light in the room. It harvests the light in the room to power itself. It's a multi-touch HD display. Uh, being able to split water using sunlight to create oxygen and hydrogen. You know, nature does this trillions of times a day. We're now figuring out how to do this for ourselves. Harvesting energy from shoes. There are shoes now that as you walk, it generates energy. And after a few hours of walking, it's enough power to power your mobile device, you know, full charge. Being able to harvest energy from the environment. So we generate, you know, I mentioned earlier, a billion Wi-Fi devices will be shipped by 2012. Well, a billion Wi-Fi devices generate a lot of Wi-Fi spectrum. Could we harvest that? Well, there are some technologies um, that uh, uh, RCA, for example, has a product that can literally harvest Wi-Fi energy from the air and then use that to charge a battery. Even things as creative as en harvesting energy from noise. So imagine talking on your mobile device and the act of talking generates energy. And then Dust Networks, who's down the street from us, has recently announced an IPv6 um, moat set, uh, moat, uh, set which is a set of IPv6-enabled sensors that, that harvest energy from the air. So they simply pull um, Wi-Fi and solar and whatnot from the air to power themselves. So the, the point to this is that there are some creative approaches to managing energy. It's not about Uber solutions. It's about many solutions working together with the networking, uh, gluing them all together. This is an example of my dashboard of my car. Um, <coughs> I've done about 2,000 miles in this car now, and I'm getting about 400 miles to the gallon. Um, and the only time I put gasoline or petrol in this car was when I purchased it and drove it home from the dealership. I've not put gasoline in it yet. Uh, companies uh, like NXP ha are developing IP-enabled light bulbs, where each individual light bulb is IPv6 addressable. There are thousands of them in a building. What if you could control light bulbs individually? You know, if I come into work on a Saturday and I flick the light switch on, every single light in that building or in that floor turns on. The entire floor is heated or cooled. It's incredibly inefficient. And we're seeing this happen billions of times over every single day from homes to buildings. So as we control things on a more um, individual level, through the network, we'll get a lot more efficient with energy consumption. And the message, of course, is that anything that generates or consumes energy will be connected to and managed by the network in the coming years. So let's talk about you for a minute. So we have always adapted to technology. This is the classic VCR example. We've all seen this. We've most likely all had a VCR where the, the time blinked 12 o'clock continually because none of us could figure out how to change the time, so we lived with it. This is an example of you adapting to technology. Well, that's about to change, and this is more than about VCRs. This is about technology for the first time adapting to us on our own terms. We have now gotten to the point where because of compute power, because of connectivity, um, because of clever software, technology is now starting to adapt to us. And a few examples, so machine vision. Machines are learning to see. This is not about scanning a barcode. This is about machines being able to understand images like we can understand images. Uh, a couple of examples, you know, Google Goggles here, being able to look at products, being able to get competitive information, being able to look at um, availability, things like that. You can even point Google Goggles with your mobile phone at a Sudoku puzzle now and it will solve that Sudoku puzzle for you because of the, the intelligence in the cloud. Uh, imagine if you could walk into a store and hold up a product off the shelf to a camera, and the camera recognized that product, not because it looked at a barcode, but because it looked at the product, and it could show you what was inside it, where it was manufactured, green information, things like that. That's coming. 
be able to use your voice to communicate. Um, we had Apple's announcing the iPhone 5 in a few days. There's a lot of speculation. There'll be a lot of voice capability built into that product where you can start talking to your phone using natural language interfaces. We're seeing some of this ready with products like Google Search, uh, Dragon, uh, uh, owned by Nuance, being able to use your voice to do Facebook updates and Twitter updates and things like that. So being able to use vision and voice and other capabilities. Uh, augmented reality, we're seeing AR in healthcare, in retail, in education, being able to overlay digital data on top of, uh, on top of the um, real, real world. Uh, imagine augmented reality over telepresence where I could do facial recognition as I'm talking to each of you and get real-time information about who you are, the publications that you, you're writing for, uh, your background, things like that. Imagine a physician talking to a patient at home. Uh, the physician, physician gets real-time information about that patient overlaid on the screen using augmented reality. Those are things that we're starting to see. Uh, we're starting to see uh, augmented reality now move into glasses. Uh, in Brazil, for example, they're using glasses that do um, the, the police in Brazil are testing glasses that can do 200 face recognitions per second. Because they're scanning a crowd in a stadium, perhaps. They're doing real-time facial recognition. Uh, this year, a company called Vuzix announced augmented reality glasses with um, location-based services built in and head tracking. So as you look around your environment, uh, based on context on what you're looking at, you'll see information projected into your eyes uh, in real time. And then within the next decade or so, we should start to see augmented reality contact lenses that are powered by the glucose in your own uh, blood cells to power them. And wearing eyeglasses that project imagery on top of the, uh, uh, or other contact lenses that project imagery on top of the contact lenses. So as you look around your world, you're seeing uh, information being broadcast into your retina in real time. And then technologies like gesture-based computing. Gesture became quite mainstream with um, Microsoft Connect. So we're seeing more and more gesture interfaces, being able to change the channel with, uh, with a, a flick of your wrist, being able to look at digital signage and being able to flick through content by uh, uh, gesturing. Digital signage, where the signs know who you are. Uh, NEC, as an example, has some technology that um, uh, in a digital signage, they can do face recognition, they can determine your age, your gender, how long you're looking at it, what you're looking at, are you interested, are you bored, uh, being able to estimate your age within a few years. We're moving into a world quite quickly now where you no longer watch television, television watches you. So in the coming years, we'll see cameras embedded in your TV and imagine that television looking at you. Are you interested in the show that you're watching? Looking at the brands that you're wearing? Look at the, looking at the things in your own home with your permission to opt in? And then serving up real-time information about, uh, about who you, uh, ads that are targeted to you, perhaps even changing the plot endings on shows based on what it's learned about you. So more and more technology that starts to understand who you are and starts to do customized, very targeted things to you. This is all about technology adapting to us. And if we take this kind of a little bit further, what about so the ultimate integration of technology and biology? So we're seeing some pretty interesting advances in brain-machine interfaces. Uh, prosthetics, for example, being able to control prosthetic limbs by thought alone. Toyota has a wheelchair that uh, if you're paralyzed, if you sit in this wheelchair, you can control the navigation of the wheelchair using thought alone. There was an article in the San Jose Mercury News, which is a local newspaper, last Sunday. They showed a technology where they can scan human brains uh, through MRI type scans. And as the person is thinking, they're able to render in real time an image of what that person is thinking on a computer screen. And in the coming decades, they believe that they might even be able to scan your brain and take what you've dreamt about that night and turn it into a video that you can watch the next day. So some really interesting advances in this whole notion of brain-machine interfaces. So the message, of course, is for the first time now, technology is finally adapting to us on our own terms, enabled by the network. One of the really exciting areas I want to talk about that I think is going to be quite revolutionary over the coming years is this notion of 3D printing. 
we're on the verge of mass customization. And yeah, historically, it's been about one size fitting all. You go to the store, you buy clothing, and you, you kind of force fit it, a small, medium, large, and you sort of pick the one that's close to you, and you buy it. That's about to change significantly. It's about being able to customize things for individuals. And if you think over the last few years, so this logical progression of physical to digital, you know, in many cases now, we don't buy a physical book, we download the book electronically. We don't buy a DVD, we download the movie. We don't buy music, uh, you know, we don't buy the CD, we download the music, of course. Well, what about physical, tangible goods? What about those? Well, in the future, we will download things, physical objects. And this is a process called additive manufacturing or 3D printing. And this, if you compare additive manufacturing to subtractive manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing is primarily what we use today. It's about taking a block of something, aluminum or plastic, and in many cases simply removing the parts that you don't care about and then you're left with an object. Well, 3D printing, of course, is this notion of printing things layer by layer by layer until you get the thing that you want, the physical good. Well, there's some basic things that we can print today, um, uh, toys, things like that, models. Of significance to this slide is the one at the bottom. This is a bicycle. It's called the air bike. It's printed by the European Air Defense System. This is a bike that you can print and then literally ride it out of the store. And I brought a few other just examples just to illustrate. Uh, these are things that were printed. This is a bicycle chain. Uh, the significance of this bicycle chain is that it wasn't, these were not individual links that were printed. The, the whole thing was printed like this, and it's a fully movable you know, product. And you can print more complex things. You know, here's moving gears, and it's printed like this. You take it out of the printer, and it's a moving product. Um, imagine you're working in your garden at home, and you have a spade, you have a shovel, and you break it. Well, normally you go to the store. Well, what about in the coming years? You decide, well, I want to print a replacement. So here's a replacement you know, um, handle for my shovel. You know, it's hard plastic. But interestingly enough, we're seeing printers now that can print 40 different types of things, different metals, aluminums, plastics, and so on. Uh, here's a hair dryer, and I'll turn it on so you can hear it. So here's a hair dryer. Now the electronics were not printed today, but the shell was printed. Uh, you know, we all have kids that lose their critical Lego piece. You know, they're building a model. Well, imagine if you know you could print a replacement Lego piece. You know, that'll be trivial in the next few years. But more importantly, you know, we'll start to uh, print things in the home, and I'll get back to that. As a by way of example, when I did this presentation on stage. We showed a life-size turboprop engine and propeller. This was 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot, one of the largest things ever 3D printed. Uh, this entire engine, functional, uh, it was plastic, so it's not combustion, but fully movable, fully mechanical. Uh, the whole thing was printed. It was printed from 188 separate parts, simply because they didn't have a printer big enough to print this thing as a single unit. And then it was assembled. But here's what's significant about this. Had they machined this using traditional techniques, it would have cost them almost a million dollars, about nine hundred thousand dollars to print or to manufacture. With three D printing, they printed it for a cost of about twenty five thousand dollars. That's a eight hundred seventy five thousand dollars savings, or ninety seven percent savings. Instead of taking nine months to machine, it took them a little over a month to machine or to print, I should say. That's a time savings of seven and a half months, or eighty three percent. Think about how much prototyping they could do and how much money they're now saving because they can now print things. So they can print something, make a change, print a replacement, make a change, and so on. So we're going to start to see accelerated rates of innovation because we now have different ways to, to print. So what about other materials? I sort of alluded to uh, other things. We're seeing things like stainless steel and aluminum uh, being printed. We'll start to see a lot of custom jewelry in the coming years uh, printed. Uh, prosthetics. Prosthetics are very uh, expensive, um, very difficult to manufacture. Well, what if you could scan someone and then simply print out a prosthetic in a matter of hours? Um, we're seeing 3D printers that can print parts for fighter planes. You take the part out of the fighter or out of the printer and then immediately put it into, into the fighter plane. So very ruggedized um, things being printed. 
Uh, in 2010, the entire shell of a car was printed, the Irby, uh, so the entire uh, shell. We could see in the coming years going online, designing the car that you want to buy, having it printed, and then the next day you go down to your dealership and pick up that vehicle. What about other things? What about food? So some interesting advances and uh, work going on around uh, 3D printers for food. Now, um, I'm a terrible cook, and I would love the ability to print a nice meal. Um, what if I could use a 3D printer and download the recipe for something over the network, perhaps my grandmother's meatloaf recipe, and I could download that, and then I could print it in a matter of minutes while I'm uh, entertaining guests. This is coming. This is important for people perhaps that have allergies. Uh, maybe you have diabetes. You've got other sort of ailments that what you eat is very critical. You can't have peanut products, for example, um, in the food. So you can print things down to the molecular level and get targeted uh, to food, targeted food based on who you are. Even printing much larger um, objects like homes. Uh, we'll see homes in the coming years being 3D printed. Why? Because it's significantly faster than traditional printing methods. It costs about half the price, and we can print interesting structures that can't be manufactured using traditional construction techniques. We'll start to see these types of printers sent to Mars so that when man sets foot on Mars in the coming decades, there will be habitats available for him and her to occupy. But what about us? What about printing parts of human beings? Well, Dr. Anthony Atala, who at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, has been working on this for some time. Today, there's about 22 types of tissues that can be manufactured, if you will, in labs. These are not printed, these are manufactured, but they're moving into uh, 3D printing. He literally took an HP inkjet printer cartridge and he removed the ink and replaced it with uh, human cells. They're now beginning to be able to print human replacement organs. It will be a decade plus before you can go and get a replacement organ printed, but these are early stages. This is the beginning. Um, in March of this year, he printed a, uh, a kidney mold on stage at the TED conference, showing a proof of principle that this can be done. So this is something we'll start to see. Even today, you can go to sites like Shapeways, and you can browse through thousands of products, thousands of recipes, if you will, you can select the one that interests you and you can download it and print it with your local 3D printer or you can have them print it for you or you can design a product uh, using your own computer and then upload it so other people can buy it and download it and print it. So on this slide I have an example of an iPhone case. Let's say I want an iPhone case, a new one. I can design my own and, and print it or I can go to Shapeways and they could, uh, I could select from the hundreds that they've got They'll print it for me and they'll ship it to me in a little over a week. And it can be plastic and it can be metal. What about the cost curve? I and mean, what's the reality of getting one of these in every home? Well, according to Jeff Kowalski, who's the CTO of Autodesk, they do a lot of 3D CAD CAM um, technology, he believes that 3D printers are following the same price curve as 2D printers. And I would tend to agree. If you look at the cost of a HP LaserJet printer in 1984, it cost $3,500. Today you can buy it for a fraction of that. Today you can buy a 3D printer for one third the cost of what that HP LaserJet printer cost just a few years ago. A printer, a 3D printer that cost a million dollars in 2006 will cost only a couple of hundred dollars in 2021, within a decade or so. We might have these in every home, just like we have a dishwasher or a refrigerator. You know, it wasn't that long ago where a refrigerator, even in most countries, even developed countries, was a luxury or was not, it was cost prohibitive. Today, we think nothing of having a refrigerator. Tomorrow, we may think nothing of having a 3D printer in every home and then downloading a recipe when you need to print something out. So the message, of course, is we will download things as easily as we download music today. Now, as we create all of this technology, as information grows exponentially, in some fields, uh, we're, not create, we're not keeping up with the demand. So take healthcare as an example. The number of doctors um, is staying relatively flat relative to the population. 
then we're creating zettabytes of new information. We will need more tools to help us manage all of this. So what, what are we seeing? We're seeing virtual people emerge. These are not avatars. These are synthetic um, artificial entities. Think about IBM's Watson. Think about some of those advances. If these were the visual front ends to that intelligent back end, within the next decade or so, we will start to see machines that for all intents and purposes are superior to humans in terms of intelligence because these machines can tap into all the world's information whereas we're limited to what's in our cranium today. You can see the kind of advances of the last decade alone, virtual valor in the lower left, current state of the art, art technology in the center, and then one that's of interest which is worth looking at on YouTube, search for image metrics Emily, is a, um, a synthetic character Emily, and I would task you to differentiate Emily from a human being. It's that good. Uh, the quality of the rendering is so good, you'll swear that it's a human being. It's not. It's synthetically rendered. So the point is we're seeing some really good advances in virtual entities. Uh, this is a brief example we did for a, a banking customer recently um, where you can walk to a bank branch, you can have a conversation with this virtual character. The virtual character can remember who you are through uh, facial recognition, things like that. We're seeing a lot of interesting advances in robotics or biomimetics, as it's called, this knowledge, this notion of um, uh, being able to create machines based on, on evolution or biology. Um, lots of interesting advances in uh, machine learning, um, physical dexterity. Uh, another video that's worth looking at is um, Big Dog from a company called Boston Dynamics. This is a really fascinating uh, military application where this big dog is about the size of a mule. You, it'll clamber over any sort of terrain, rock, ice, snow. It will maintain its balance. You can try to push it over and it will, it will maintain its balance. You should look at that video. It, it's very organic in terms of some of the advances that we're seeing. What's the network relevancy here? Well, the network relevancy, of course, is that these are sensor-laden devices with video and sensors, and they're all connecting to the network. So the network plays a big role in these devices. So let me just wrap with the last chapter and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So all of those nine things I talked about had one thing in common, and that was the network enables all of those experiences, all of those capabilities. I want to change topic and talk about one more fundamental change that's coming. Just to wrap this chapter up, to wrap this deck up, it's something a little more provocative. And that's about us as a species. We are learning at such exponential rates that we are starting to change who we are. We have sort of crossed this threshold of discovery and we're now sort of becoming masters of our own destiny. And Stephen Hawking, I think most know, he and I agree on this. Human beings are entering a stage of self-designed evolution. This, we're entering a new epoch in terms of who we are. We're seeing the early, early stages now um, where we're quickly being able to replicate most parts of the human body. We're being able to fix most of the issues. We're starting to get uh, a grasp on some of these diseases and, and uh, making great strides. There's a number of examples on this slide, but it, being able to do things like print, 3D, uh, 3D print replacement organs. Uh, artificial retinas so that people that couldn't see before can now see. Uh, being able to implant a cochlear implant in the ear so a child who is born deaf can now hear for the first time. And the list goes on and on and on. We're starting to see many, many, many advances in self-evolving. Now, a number of scientists came out last year and they said, you know, this aging problem that we've got as a species we believe that within the next few decades, by 2029 specifically, we will be able to stop the aging process. Now, whether or not human beings will live indefinitely is, is subjective and open for discussion, but I think one thing is pretty certain, and that is that humans are going to start living a lot longer. The number of people that are past 100 is unprecedented in our history. A child born today will conservatively live to be two to three hundred years old. That's the path that we're on because of advances in healthcare and medicine. What does that mean from a um, societal perspective? What does it mean for relationships? 
What does it mean for education? Perhaps you have multiple sort of careers in your lifetime. It certainly changes the way that we think about government programs. It thinks about the, it changes the way we think about 401k and retirement plans. I mean, if you're going to live to be 200 years old, well, with our current societal norms, I can guarantee you your uh, your current 401k or retirement plan will likely run out long before you reach 200. So uh, this is more philosophical, but the point is that we are starting to self-evolve. We're starting to take destiny into our own hands, and we're starting to change who we are as a species. So just to kind of close on the material, the network matters today, of course, more than it ever has. It, it changes who we are, how we communicate, how we share knowledge, but not nearly as much as it will do in the coming years. And you know, the journey has only just begun for this sort of transformation that we're in. This is just the beginning uh, of this sort of uh, path that we're on. So let me kind of close there with the presentation, and then we have some time for, for Q&A or reactions. Thank you so much, Dave, for very, very interesting thoughts. And uh, uh, feel free, I'm uh, now addressing uh, our guests uh, across the region. Um, who wants to go with the uh, with the first question, or if you have any comments to share, uh, any of your thoughts to share on the on the story? So, who wants to go first? And, and reactions are good too, by the way. I'd love to get feedback on the material. Uh, if you don't have a specific question, that's fine. But if you have any kind of feedback, that's always helpful for me too. Oh, okay, so I, I see, okay, uh, I, I'm so first bell, great, so just unmute to the mic and, uh, okay, perfect, and then we go to Macedonia and Poland, okay. Uh, hi, hi Dave, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, I have one question about cloud, you said that the, the third of uh, information is beyond cloud, so that, that the educational system will, will change, uh, what what you mean by that, I mean, uh, if we have all information on cloud, how are we going to treat our children? What is important and what is not? Right. So, um, as we think about education and the current paradigms for education, you know, giving everyone a textbook, for example, well, could we think about education a little bit differently and make it much more immersive, much more interactive, so that they're experiencing things that are online? Um, an example might be if I'm um, if I'm a child if my child is in school learning like, I'll give you a real example my kids are in school now one of them is learning Spanish while well, he listens to this the speaker the teacher in his classroom but why couldn't he for example use technology like this and talk to someone in Spain get educated by that person in Spain if I'm teaching um, kids about the pyramids in Egypt, why can't they visit that location through virtual technology, through telepresence, through the networking technology? So I think as we think about um, the experience of educating, we need to think about that differently. Uh, as we think about um, kind of some of this rote, repetitive um, ways that we educate our kids, if all the world's knowledge is going to be online and accessible uh, with tools like Watson and Wolfram Alpha and Google and some of the other things, it, perhaps there's other approaches that we could take in terms of how to educate our kids, because it, it's there already. Um, how do we bring more of that knowledge into the classroom so that they can learn about uh, the world in different ways? I think some of the paradigms that we've got need to be questioned. Um, the, in, in the U.S., in some cases, it's now taking six years to go through the uh, university or college education system because they're so crowded and it's so difficult to get the classes that you need. So instead of taking six years, what, what can we do to put more and more of that online? Are the traditional models where we go to a university, where we spend four years or now six years in a university, could we think about some of those models a little bit differently? Could we do more in the home? Could we do more 
um, virtual universities. I, I think the point is, as we have more and more intelligence in the cloud, as we get more and more connected, as we get more and more immersive, collaborative video technology, should we think about the educational system a little bit differently? Thank you. I think Macedonia had a question, so we go to <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, let me just say that this was a great presentation, and I enjoyed it. But uh, I had one question for Mr. Evans, because I'm coming from a business magazine. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the next technology trends for the businesses? Because let's say, for, for example, in Macedonia, uh, the, the business community is just discovering the cloud computing, is, its usage and its positive side. So what will be the next thing for businesses in this area? Yeah, I right. Right. So there, are, yeah, there are many. Of course, I mean, you touched on one cloud is a big one. Um, we're seeing the workforce itself begin to shift. We're seeing um, everything from the physical workforce to how we think about the workplace, uh, moving away from cubicles and fixed locations to much more collaborative, you know, open workplaces. So the, the workplace can't phys physically is changing. Cisco just recently announced something called the Connected World Report. We announced it last Wednesday. There's a lot of great information we can share with you in it about what we see in terms of trends in the workplace. The expectations of people coming into the workplace are changing now quite a bit. Um, the demographic of people that are now graduating college and moving into the workplace, the expectation of them, of their employer, of their workplace, of the tools that they're given are quite different. Um, for example, you know, social networking. You know, anyone coming into the workplace today, there's an expectation that they have access to social networking, Facebook and Twitter and things like that. And yet we still see companies and organizations that shut off those capabilities for employees. And I would submit that they're doing a service perhaps to their employees because the workforce coming in now, that's how they communicate, that's how they work, that's how they share. So I think we're seeing trends around different types of infrastructure models, things like tablets and cloud and virtualization so, you know, from a technology perspective. We're seeing changes in terms of the environment itself, the physical environment, um, more mobile, more teaming, more collaborative, and then the expectations of the people coming into the workforce around their expectations of social, uh, social networking, some of those things. So those might be three or so uh, examples. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I think we had an indication from Poland, so Warsaw. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Katarzyna Burda from Music Poland. Uh, I have my first question will be uh, a bit philosophical uh, because uh, I'm, I think I'm not ready for uh, those technologies uh, you talked about. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, our privacy in uh, the connected world, uh, about uh, how can we uh, protect our private lives uh, uh, when every machine will be, uh, will know everything about us. Yeah, no, that, that is a fantastic question, that comes up a lot. This, this is not a, it is somewhat philosophical in that this is not a technological question, I believe, because Technology by itself is sort of, it's neither good nor bad, right? It's, it's a tool that we use. And we need to be careful that we don't allow some of these tools to be used for the wrong reasons. And I think it's important for us as a society to say, you know, we want to be connected, we want to be able to share um, with family and friends, but not at the expense of privacy erosion. I think it's important that we let companies know it's important that we let you know companies that are providing these services to us, these social networking services and others, we need to let them know that privacy erosion is not acceptable. We need to let our governments know that privacy erosion is not acceptable. And this is a more of a societal slash political um, um, issue, I believe, than it is a technological issue. So as, as people, as societies, we simply need to say, this is what we're willing to accept, and this is what we're not willing to accept. Uh, you you mentioned in your uh, uh, may I ask another question? Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about uh, quantum internet. Uh, I would like to ask uh, how quantum computing can change internet. Uh, what technology of computing will be the, in the nearest future? Maybe right. DNA okay. computing. Right. Okay. 
So there's two elements of, of this quantum quantum physics that I think could be relevant for networking, possibly three. Um, first of all, let me just be clear. We're very, very early on with understanding and building quantum computers. It may be 10, 15 years before we have really good, viable quantum computers. But the promise of quantum computing, because quantum computers are massively parallel and very, very fast, the promise is that we should be able to build computing devices that are orders of magnitude faster than what we have today. In fact, there's um, there's a book called Q, and it talks about quantum computing. And uh, one of the estimates, if I, if I recall correctly, one of the estimates was that if you took a planet the size of Earth and you covered it with silicon computing, a molecule-sized quantum computer has the equivalent processing power of 5,000 planets covered with silicon computers. The point simply is, quantum computers, if we can harness that capability, uh, have the promise to be significantly faster. So point one is the our ability to process information will be billions of times faster than it is today. So our ability to process video, for example, uh, our ability to analyze data which should be significant. So one is our ability to process. Two, there is this notion of quantum entanglement where basically quantum entanglement says if you change the characteristics of one particle, back up, if you entangle two particles together and then you separate them by some distance, if you change the characteristics of one of them, it's immediately reflected in the other one regardless of the distance. So if we can, and it's called quantum entanglement, if we can harness that capability, what it means is that we could, in theory, uh, and they're starting to do this already over short distances, you know, 20 kilometers, let's say, uh, if we can entangle two things across a quantum connection, if we change the characteristics on one end, it's immediately reflected in the other with zero latency, zero delay. So that could mean that in the coming decades, we could transmit unlimited data from point A to point B instantaneously, regardless of distance. That could be from here to Warsaw. It could be from here to Bucharest. It could be here from uh, here to Mars. It could be here.